just for laughs. When I was 10, I thought that I would live forever. I could kill whatever I pleased. I was all that mattered. How else can one explain the firecrackers stuffed down throats of frogs and lit hop, hop, boom? A lot of laughs. Once we found a plump snake sunning itself beside the creek. Sluggish in the early morning chill, it only raised its head and turned two diamond black eyes to see four small boys with sticks. It didn't understand until we started beating on its flanks that we were dangerous and it was trapped. Our sticks were too light and we too timid to inflict anything but fury. So we started throwing stones. Small gashes ripped that snake's fat thrashing sides until it finally tired, though it couldn't run and wouldn't die. It only lay there heaving as the stones fell faster till a miracle of birth, a miracle of birth, began so strangely even we were brought up short and stood there for a moment dumbly watching. Out of those gashes crawled a dozen baby water snakes, a dozen more small wriggling slivers of their mother's flesh. Some were bleeding, some had broken backs and dragged limp tails sideways through the dust. Premature, even the ones uninjured that we carried home and put in jars, all died. But it didn't matter. We had frogs and painted turtles, salamanders and a praying mantis. Years later, I volunteered for war still oblivious to what I'd done, or what I was about to do, or why. Our guest today on Military Matters is Bill Earhart. Bill Earhart is a Vietnam veteran. He was in the Tet Offensive of 1968, fought in the Battle of Way. He is probably one of America's most renowned poets on Vietnam. He is also part of the Ken Burns documentary on Vietnam and part of Mark Bowden's book, he is also a teacher of history and English at the renowned school, Haverford School in the Philadelphia Main Line. Your uh, opening poem was very prolific. That incident actually um, haunted me for years, and I, I tried to write about it a number of times and could never, I never could make it work. And for some reason, who knows how this stuff happens, uh, when I connected it to joining the Marines, then the poem worked, and of course that's how it ends, is uh, years later I volunteered for war, still oblivious to what I'd done or what I was about to do or why. And here's the thing, that had any of us four kids, we were 10 years old, if any of us had encountered that snake alone, we would have gone, whoa, that's a big snake, and given it a wide berth. But the four of us together, we each had to prove we're not afraid of this snake. We're tough guys. We, peer pressure. And, of course, it turns out that when I got in the middle of the war in Vietnam, I discovered the same thing. You, you behave, you, you perform, you do things in combat that you would never do if you were by yourself. But the primary motivation of young men in battle is, for me it certainly was, I did not want my buddies to know how frightened I was. I did not want my pals to see the real me who is a coward. And so you do things so that they don't realize who you really are. And of course, many, many years after the war, I realized that all of my buddies were doing exactly the same thing. And that's what happens in that poem. We would have left that snake alone if any of us would have encountered it one-on-one. -on -one. Instead, we killed it. You joined the Marines at 17. How did you get in the Marines at 17? And why did you join the Marines at 17? So, how much time do we have here? It's very complicated. Uh, certainly, you have to understand, I grew up in a, in a small town in Upper Bucks County, Perksy, Pennsylvania. Very white, very Republican. Um, no one, well... There were people in our town, uh, you saw bumper stickers that said, better, better dead than red. It was the Cold War. I remember the Hungarian revolt and the Russians crushing their attempt at freedom. I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Berlin Wall, Nikita Khrushchev banging his shoe on the table at the UN, shouting, we will bury you. There was nothing in my life 
up to 1966 to suggest to me that the world might be somewhat different than what my nation, what my government, what my environment, what my teachers, what my community was telling me this is how the world is. And here's, you know, here's Lyndon Johnson saying if we do not stop the communists in Vietnam, we will one day have to fight them on the sands of Waikiki. Sounded serious to me. Add to that that I grew up in the shadow of the Second World War. Um, I was, I, I was lived on a diet of John Wayne movies and Audie Murphy movies and William Holden and they were all heroes and 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 now here's my chance. I can be a hero. I can fight in a war. Um, and of course it was always going to be the Marines because I'm a little guy. The Marine Corps is full of little guys with chips on their shoulder. Nobody was ever going to beat me up again and besides, you ever seen that dress blue uniform the Marines wear? Yeah. It's gorgeous. I have girls hanging on my neck like succulent grapes. Um, and I would never be beat up again. Um, college could wait. I was always going to go to college. I grew up in a college-oriented family. Um, my two older brothers were in college, and that's another thing. It's like, no matter what I did, my older brothers had already done it. Get good grades, be a varsity athlete. Well, they were both in college. I could join the Marines. Uh, so it's a whole bunch of things that came together. Um, and my parents were not all that keen about me joining the Marine Corps. Um, and it wasn't that they were opposed to the war. I, I got my values from them. Um, but who, what mother wants their kid to join the Marines in the middle of a war when he could go to college? And my mother told me, I, don't, I remember a long heated discussion. I don't remember this part, but my mom told me years later that I ended the discussion when I said to her, is this the way you raised me, to let other mother's sons fight America's wars? And my mom said, what can I say to that? That's not the way my parents raised me. So they signed the papers. I think my mother also knew that if she didn't sign those papers, I would have spent the summer of 1966 making her life a living hell and I would have joined the Marines the day I turned 18 in September. So there was also that going on. But So there you go. So That's off you went to Vietnam. Eventually, yeah. By I, the time I got to Vietnam, I hardly got to see Saigon. You know that one. Yeah, well, I never went to Saigon until 1985. When did you come to think differently about the American involvement in Vietnam? Oh, goodness. I got my first dose of what's going on here about three days after I got to Vietnam, got to my battalion, 1st Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment. Um, I, was, uh, I went down to the amphibious tractor park. I was in the battalion intelligence section. Um, and I went down to the tractor park with a Corporal Jimmy Sal. He was the guy I was going to replace eventually, salty old corporal of maybe 20, 19. Um, and we were, went down to pick up some Vietnamese detainees that were being sent in from one of the rifle companies. Detainees are not prisoners of war, they're civilians who were detained for questioning. And there were a set of rules that you were supposed to use to how you treat them. They're not prisoners of war. Well, these two tractors pull into the park, into the track park, and before they even come to a stop, Marines up on top start throwing these people down. Amphibious tractors are big armored boxes that are about eight feet tall and they have a black, a, a flat top. The Marines up there start throwing these people off. They're bound hand and foot. Uh, it's old men, women, children. They have no way to break their fall. They're tossing these people onto the ground. And I, and I, I won't, well, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I was shocked and I expressed my shock and Corporal Sal told me to shut my freaking face and be done with it. And, but at that point, I realized, whoa, something's going on here that's not exactly what I was told. Um, it went downhill from there. That was in February of 67. By June of 67, I was one of the Marines up on top of the tractors tossing people off. Um, by that point, by the summer of 67, I could not think of any reason on earth why I was in Vietnam except to stay alive until March the 5th, 1968, and then I could go home. I didn't know what was going on there. It made no sense at all by any yardstick I'd been given to measure with. I just knew this is crazy. 
I don't want to die here. I want, I want out. And I managed to get to the end of my tour, came home, uh, still had 15 months to do in the Corps. Um, right up until May, early, <clears throat> early May of 1970, by this time I'm a freshman in college, I keep trying to pretend this doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm out of it. I don't know what's going on over there, but it, I'm, I'm out. I got all ten fingers, all ten toes. Meanwhile, I'm engaged in incredibly self-destructive behavior, largely revolving around drinking and driving. When I got to college, I added marijuana to that. Um, I was profoundly unhappy. And it was only when the murders at Kent State took place in May of 1970 when the Ohio National Guard murdered four kids um, and wounded nine others that I finally started thinking, I got to understand what happened. Um, it was another year as I was reading and researching, another year before I fully understood what had actually happened, and that was when the Pentagon Papers started being published in June of 1971, and when I read those, I, I ran out of any possible excuse for what the United States was doing in Vietnam. So it was a very long, drawn-out process. You wanted to survive until 1968. However, you had to get past the Tet Offensive of 1968. And in, during the Tet Offensive, you, coincidentally, ended up in what was probably the pivotal battle of Vietnam, the turning point, and the Battle of Way. What happened there? Well, well, that was interesting because I spent 12 months running around the rice fields looking for the Viet Cong, and you couldn't find them. They absolutely controlled the battlefield. If they wanted to engage you, they engaged you, and if they didn't want to engage you, you couldn't find them, period. Um, and then, with one month to go, Marine Corps did, did 13 months. Everybody else did 12 months. The Marines did 13 min months in Vietnam. One, one of many reasons why we're called jarheads. Um, I then spent my last month in this huge battle in an urban setting, uh, very, very much like uh, the battle for Seoul in the Korean War, battle for Stalingrad, all this, it was urban fighting, very, very different from what I'd done for the first 12 months. Uh, we didn't know what we were getting into, um, but you know, once you're in the middle of it, there you go. There's not much you can do about it, but it was very different. It was house-to-house -house fighting. It was not just house-to-house. -house. It was floor-to-floor, -floor, room-to-room. Uh, I think you mentioned Mark Bowden's book. I think he does a pretty good job of describing how that whole thing unfolded, but it was, it was ugly. It was nasty. It was, um, I, I certainly don't want to do it again. The one thing it did provide was that for once, for once in my entire tour, there were guys who were over in that cross the street and they're over there going, you want this building? Come and take it from us. Screw you. Um, whereas most of the time, said we, our enemy was mines and booby traps. We had dead Marines day in and day out for an entire year and no one to fight at, no one to fight back at. That's how things like the My Lai Massacre occur. I never saw anything on that scale, but after a while, you just come to the conclusion they're all freaking VC, which they probably were. I did get wounded. I got hit with fractal from a rocket propelled grenade, one of those like bazooka type things you see on TV with the little pointy headed rocket at the end of it. Uh, I was lucky in that I, I did, here I am, I'm still alive, um, but then when High-speed steel starts flying around. You're, you're basically you're either lucky or you're dead or badly wounded. I went through a window, went past between, past my head in the window frame, and blew up in the wall behind me. Um, and I was, but I was hunched over in a very heavily padded chair. This was like the mayor's house or governor, somebody. He'd left town, but we took his house over. So I'm in a heavily padded chair, I'm wearing my body armor, my helmet and flak jacket, and I'm hunched over, firing out the window. Um, very little of my body was actually exposed. I got some, some cuts on my right arm, my right leg, and my lower back. Uh, a buddy of mine was across the room, much further from the blast than I was, 
uh, he got hit much worse than me because he was not wearing body armor. Um, but you know, it's it's like you either you either lucky or you're dead. That that's that's what happened. You came home to a, a nation in turmoil in 1968. I had a hard time dealing with the United States in general for a lot of reasons. I actually went. I had 15 months to do in the Corps uh, when I got back. I had signed a three-year contract. Um, I was sent to North Carolina, which is like. A Yankee Marine in eastern North Carolina, it's like two strikes and you're out. Uh, you don't have to wait for the third strike. And I knew if I stayed there, I was going to end up dead or in the brig. I went back to Asia. They sent me to Okinawa, which is like, picture, picture the biggest, smelliest, rottenest armpit in the universe. That's Okinawa. I got stuck there for three months, uh, managed to get myself away from there and ended up in Japan and I spent my last seven months in the Corps going back and forth between Japan and the Philippines which was actually kind of cool. Um, I got back to the States, got out of the Marines June of 69. Within a few weeks I went over to uh, England, going to hitchhike around looking at England but I ended up on, on a little Irish freighter, a little ship, going back and forth between Dublin and Liverpool for most of that summer. But the thing is, I avoided the United States as long as I possibly could. I just didn't want to deal with it. Um, I was a mess. I was absolutely a mess. Eventually, in the fall of 69, I started college. Yes, America was crazy. I get, I get home, and a, a month after, less than a month after I'm home, King is killed, Kennedy is killed. Of course, I'm out of the country by early July, but then in, in August, I think it was, early August, you get that uh, the police, the police riots in, in Detroit, Chicago. Yeah, I mean, Chicago, no, not Chicago. Sorry. This yeah. is the cops rioting. Yeah, the Democratic it is unbelievable uh, display of American fascism. Um, by that time, I'm I'm out of the country, back in back in Asia again. But yeah, it was a turbulent time, and it stayed a turbulent time. People. People that I teach now, and you know, I teach at the Haverford School, I teach high school boys. A, a very prestigious they, school in the main line. You America. know, they think, they think, wow, the 60s, the Beatles, marijuana, free love. The 60s was a terrible time to be young. Um, it was a horrible, unhappy, unpleasant time. Uh, it, was not a, it was not a good time to be around. What, what, what is your relation with, um, you know Sheehan, Martin Sheehan? He did a documentary in 1985 that was about Vietnam War veterans, and uh, I found that, and, and the narration included several of my poems. I found out subsequently that he he did that for free. He did not get paid, um, and I thought that was a nice gesture. So I managed to get his address, or at least his agent's address, from the Syracuse Public TV station, which had done this program, and. I sent him a copy of the book that the poems were in, and about six months later, I got a very nice letter back from him. Um, and I guess a little bit after that, he called me up and said he was doing a film in New York, and could I come up? He'd like to meet me. And so it, we're not exactly close pals, but I've seen him a number of times over the years. He uh, he actually <laughs> when he did that show, the the West Wing. He sent me this note saying, come out and be the guest of the acting president. Acting president. And I, my daughter had just started school at a, a new school for seventh grade. I said, I can't pull my daughter out of school like a, two weeks into the school year. Um, if you make it into a second season, I'll come next year. And I, I don't hear anything. And then like June of the, that, that, that academic year, I get this letter saying, well, we're going into season two. Are you coming? So we actually went out and spent a week with him on the set of the West Wing, which was a lot of fun. He's an interesting man. He's very uh, politically progressive, left wing. He's he's been arrested like 80 times protesting various lunatic American foreign policy stuff. What's your relationship with uh, Philip Caputo? I was with a group of writers that went to Vietnam in 1990, which was my second of three post-war trips, and Phil was on that trip. Um, so I got to know him then. And there was actually uh, something that happened um, that I, I, I won't get into, but Phil 
comported himself with great dignity and honor in the face of some of our traveling companions less than honorable behavior um, and it cemented my respect for him. It's interesting, Phil was actually in the same battalion that I was in but two years before me. He was a Marine officer. Your friend John Bakey has this uh, fabulous archival collection and, and one of the things I noticed in his collection was some paintings by an artist named Jane Ar Irish. Oh. And uh, I, I thought I would ask you because it looks like there was something that you would find attractive to that because her work isn't just oh, yeah. artistic but it's poetic at the same time, am I right? Yes. If, in fact, you ought to do a show with Jane because she is a Philadelphia artist. She is wonderful, very, very talented. Um, and she began, she got fascinated with the uh, Vietnam veterans against the war and the anti-war movement back in the late 90s and early 21st century uh, and started doing artwork that it, it incorporates this elaborate beautiful French Rococo paintings into which she drops all this stuff about the Vietnam War and Vietnam veterans against the war and she she actually includes in, in a number of her paintings and artwork, she puts the poetry in it. There's poems of mine that are in her paintings, which is like super cool. She's also traveled back to Vietnam on, on multiple occasions and she now incorporates uh, uh, visual artistry from contemporary Vietnam that she puts into her painting. She's, she's a wonderful artist. You're part of Ken Burns' Vietnam. You, um, you were pretty outspoken in that. Well, actually, they left the best stuff on the cutting room floor, um, which is... Um, I thought what you said was rather strong. Yeah, well, you <laughs> they edited me in some places quite heavily. Uh, and you need, first of all, I'm glad you asked this, because it's Ken Burns, but in fact, it's Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. Uh, Novick is... Uh, Novick contacted me in February of, 19, of 2011. I worked with her for almost seven years on a regular basis. I met Ken Byrne once in June of 2017 at a reception in New York, shook hands with him, he thanked me for being in the show. That's all I ever did with, with Ken Burns. Uh, Lynn Novick is the one who did the grunt work, her and, a, and her associate producer, Sarah Botstein. Now, how I ended up on the show, I, I've been around, I've been doing, talking about the war, writing about the war for a long time. If you start to study the Vietnam War at all, I'm kind of hard to miss. Perfectly logical for, for them to approach me. I was skeptical. I actually hadn't done a, uh, a documentary film in 20 years because I don't like having other people edit me. I can tell my own story perfectly well. Um, and I'd had some bad experiences and I simply refused to do it again. But I have to admit, Burns and Novick, Burns, that gets your attention. And Lynn Novick, when she contacted me, knew who I was, had read at least some of my work and could talk about it intelligently. I actually had somebody from the military channel call me up and ask to interview me. And they were doing programs about the Battle for Way and the Siege of Kaishan. And this woman didn't even know which of those two battles I'd been in. And I told her, go do some friggin' homework and then call me back. Of course, I never heard from her again. But Novik had taken some, some effort to figure out who is this guy. That got my attention. Uh, so I did it, but I, was real, I, was, I waited six years. I was worried about what they'd do. Let me tell you some of the stuff that they didn't include. Um, we get, we get uh, Carl Marlantis, the famous novelist, who talks about how he was verbally assaulted by anti-war demonstrators uh, as he was leaving Travis Air Force Base coming back from Vietnam. The visual that Burns and Novick show as he's saying that are a bunch of people standing there with signs. They're clearly not saying anything. They're certainly not angrily shouting. They're just standing there quietly and that's that's being verbally assaulted by anti-war people. I told them the story about how when I got back, I went to buy a car with the money I'd saved in Vietnam. My dad and I went down to West German Motors here in Fort Washington, and I bought myself a brand new, beautiful red Volkswagen right off the showroom floor, except 
I didn't buy that car. I had to give the money to my father, and he bought that car. And the owner's car was in his name for 18 months until I turned 21. And the next day, I'm now back from Vietnam, 48 hours, I go to get insurance on my brand new car, and I am told by the insurance broker that as far as the state of Pennsylvania is concerned, I am a child dependent upon my parents. I must be carried on my parents' insurance policy as a dependent child. I am a combat wounded Marine Corps sergeant just back from Vietnam, and the state of Pennsylvania says, we don't care. You're a dependent child. That's all you are to us. You want to talk spit on? That's being spit on. And I begged Novick to put that in the documentary. They didn't put it in. There's a, there's, there's a lot of stuff wrong with that documentary. The only thing right about it is that it's opened up doors for me to be able to say what I've been saying for 50 years to an audience I've not previously been able to reach. I appreciate you being um, honest with I mean, me. This is part of it, but there's a lot of other places that because I'm in that documentary, I get invited to speak, and then I can say what I just said to you that Burns and Novick wouldn't put in their film. Mark Bowden follows the same pattern. Yeah. You he, got along with Mark. Mark apparently. I'd like to get him on the show. I'm apparently the last guy he interviewed. Uh, he, he had finished the manuscript, basically, and uh, was down doing some additional research at the Johnson Library in Austin, Texas. And there's a researcher down there, and a, 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 somebody who works for the library who knows me and knows my writing, and he said, you really, you should talk to this guy Earhart. He lives right down the road from you. Bowden, you know, is at Kennett Square. Right. And uh, so Mark called me up, and we ended up having an interview. And the, the parts of me that show up in the book, he kind of jammed into the already finished manuscript. Yeah, I, I, so that I, was kind of cool. I read the book. Do um, you think of Vietnam often? Every day. How can you not? Do you? I know you're going to be angry when I ask you this question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. But, but, do you think you lost any of your humanity in Vietnam? Well, of course I did. Put it in its bluntest terms. Uh, going off to war is not a very good thing. Um, it is. It runs counter to everything most human beings are taught. Thou shalt not kill shows up in virtually every religion on the planet. Um, and so war is not a nice thing. Even It screws you up even when what you're doing is, you know, what, if we don't fight Adolf Hitler, what do you get? But when you go into a situation like that and it turns out that it's for nothing, or for worse than nothing, for the wrong reason. That's not easy to live with. Um, you're, you're a father, aren't you? Yes. So am I. Um, there are people in the world, there are people, there are people who never got the opportunity to be parents because of me. Not even figuratively, quite literally, people I killed when they were young and never got to have the experience of being married, being a parent, um, that's a hard thing to live with. And when you realize that you did it for, the, for nothing, for the wrong reasons, that those people died because of the arrogance and ignorance of a bunch of proud people in Washington, D.C. I mean, I, <laughs> no, I, get it. I live with it, you know, you learn to live with it, but it doesn't go away. Uh, and of course, what's even worse is that, you know, you said, do I think of Vietnam? I think about it every day. How can I not think about it? Every day I pick up the papers and I read about what's going on in Afghanistan, what's going on in Iraq. I hear that, I hear that one of our freaking drone missiles just killed like a bunch of school kids in Yemen. Um, it was fired by the Saudis, but we gave them the damn weaponry. And now there's a bunch of dead school kids, like 30 or 40 of them, that this bus, they hit a bus. You know, and you all read about that in the papers. I know what that feels like. I know what that smells like, the smell of human guts and blood and bone. You know, this stuff doesn't go away. And we, we as a nation don't seem to have learned the right lessons from our experience in Vietnam. Has writing poetry been cathartic for you? I bridle at the term cathartic because I've, I've spent a lifetime... That's your word, by the way. Working, ...working at my art of becoming the best poet I can be. Um, it's not therapy, you know, it's like... It's art. 
it's something that takes a great deal of time and effort and energy. Um, but if I'm honest, yeah, I think in retrospect it was very therapeutic. If you look now at manuals on mental health and you look at post-traumatic stress disorder, the very first stage in treatment of PTSD is to talk about the wound. Talk about the traumatic stress that you underwent. And of course, that's what I'm doing when I write. Now it's also true that even when I was writing about the war most intensely, I was writing about geese in the autumn and broken-hearted love poems. And the Vietnam War has never been my only subject. Um, and if you've, you know, you read through this book, there's three quarters of it has nothing to do with war. But yes, I think in retrospect, it was helpful for me. It actually taught me what I think. You know, we think that writing is a mechanical process. You take what's in your brain and put it on paper by writing or typing. Um, in fact, what you've got in your brain is a big bowl of alphabet soup. And all those letters are swirling around up there. Remember when you were a kid eating alphabet soup and you'd, and you'd take the spoon and you'd spell your name like J-I-L-L. -L. Jill! <clears throat> and well, that, That's what you're doing when you're writing, is you're actually having to dip into your brain and figure out what's there and make some sense of it. And I think writing about the war in, when I was in college was a way to help me think about what had happened to me. I remember working on a poem that was about, like, well, you anti-war people, you know, yeah, well, you wouldn't have the right to do what you're doing if it weren't for me and my buddies who protected your fr and as I'm trying to write this, I realize this is bull crap. That's not what I was doing in Vietnam. Hell, we lost the Vietnam War, and you can still worship at the church of your choice. How about that? That had nothing to do with what I was doing in Vietnam. And I remember crumbling that paper up and throwing it away because I thought, this is nonsense. I don't think this. So writing helped me sort out my thoughts, my feelings. And uh, yeah, so I guess therapy. In closing, can I ask you to read uh, Beautiful Wreckage? What if I didn't shoot the old lady running away from our patrol? Or the old man in the back of the head? Or the boy in the marketplace? Or what if the boy, but he didn't have a grenade? And the woman in way didn't lie in the rain in a mortar pit with seven marines just for food? Gaffney didn't get hit in the knee. Ames didn't die in the river. Ski didn't die on a medevac chopper between Con Tien and Da Nang. In Vietnamese, Con Tien means place of angels. What if it really was? Instead of the place of rotting sandbags, incoming heavy artillery, rats and mud. What if the angels were Ames and Ski? Were the lady, the man and the boy? And they lifted Gaffney out of the mud and healed his shattered knee. What if none of it happened the way I said? Would it all be a lie? Would the wreckage be suddenly beautiful? Would the dead rise up and walk? Thank you. You're welcome. With uh, Bill Earhart, this is John Ricciuti, Mainline Public Television, right in our Studio 21. Until next time, I hope you found this informative and educational. Thank you. Thank you.